Oh, hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode 82 of my podcast. And tonight I am joined by the fab, the funny Rory Bremner. So hello, <laughs> Rory. Hello. I've got to live up to that now. Oh, my goodness. I would love you to join you. 82. 82. You know, that's almost as old as Joe Biden. I think he's 80. I think he's done 82 years. He's done as many years Kiara, as you've done podcasts, so you're doing pretty well, pretty well. So it's well, well done. Congratulations. Thank you. And please, can you tell me all about your amazing career as a comedian and impressionist? <laughs> How long have you got? Um, oh, well, gosh, I started off at school, probably. I was uh, uh, maybe a bit of a class clown. Uh, yeah, I used to do a bit of showing off. I used to do impressions of the teachers. So well, Derek Swift, who was a brilliant French teacher, and I'm, I, he had a very distinctive voice. And he was the first person I did in public because he had the sort of school film club. And so I did him in front of the rest of the school. And I loved sports commentators like Bill McLaren, of course, who was a, a great uh, for, uh, people wouldn't remember from Scottish rugby days. And Richie Benno is a great cricket commentator. So with sports commentators, teachers, all that. Uh, but also by the time it got to the late 70s, uh, I lived in Edinburgh. And of course, every year in August, the circus came to town. You had the Edinburgh Festival. And at that time, it was amazing because we had uh, Rowan Atkinson was just starting out. The Cambridge Footlights was Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie and Emma Thompson in the same show. And the cabaret circuit was beginning in London. So when I started at university there, uh, sort of 80, 1980, 81, 82, 83, um, I was doing uh, seminars and lectures and stuff in the day. And in the evening, um, I was on the on the circuit, on the cabaret circuit in London. So doing things like, uh, you know, you just start off at the Finborough Arms in Earl's Court and uh, then jump on the Piccadilly line up to the Hemingford Arms in Islington and then back down to Battersea for Jongleurs comedy club down there and that was all sort of about 83 84 and then i got my first break with bbc radio in 84 um and uh the cabaret circuit was a great sort of hunting ground for people who wanted uh, guests on chat shows and things like russell harty's chat show um i don't know if you remember russell harty but you know he was, he was sort of, and then terry wogan and actually terry wogan he he got me on the first of his three nights a week at the bbc the old bbc and we did the show and it took off from there. That was the biggest, you know, 1985, I think it was. And I had a top 20 record about called 19 Not Out, which is a parody of uh, 19 by Paul Hardcastle. The sort of 19, you know, the, about the combat soldiers. We made it about England cricketers. Um, so 85 was my sort of big chung, um, yeah. kind of uh, um, breaking year, as it were. And uh, then from 86, I think, onwards, I had a shows at the BBC uh, and then 92 went off to Channel 4 and was working with John Bird and John Fortune by that time and the show became more political and uh, we were very lucky we had 18 years at the BBC at the at Channel 4 rather uh, up till 2010 so we so it went we went from major if you like major to minor no we started out with John Major in the sort of like middle uh, uh, well early early to middle of the 90s and then of course Along came Toby Blair, and uh, you know that was sort of nineteen ninety seven, I think, um, mm. and then that took us to to two thousand three and, and Gordon Brown, and then of course I think we did, or maybe two thousand and five, I think, and I lasted for about a year or two, and then we got David Cameron, and I sort of came in for the first time about two thousand and ten. And I think, and I had a bit of a coalition of the first few years, and then, you know, then I went on to about 2015. Well, Ed Miliband sort of came on and challenged me. He was the Labour leader in 2015, but I beat him and I carried on. And then we had Brexit because I and Boris appeared in 2016, as you know, Kiara, and uh, and we, uh, we we got that vote, uh, much to our surprise. And so Theresa May carried on. And then you got Boris, uh, and then you had all these politicians, all these prime ministers. We had six prime ministers in eight years. So Keir Starmer. It's our eighth or sixth prime minister. We're going to do a podcast. It's going to take time. It's going to get worse before it gets better. But so six prime ministers in eight years, which is crazy, because you think if you go to hospital with a head injury or dementia, what's the first thing they ask you? They say, who's the prime minister? Yeah. So no wonder the hospitals are full because people keep getting it wrong. They go, oh, is it Theresa May? I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, that was my career and the prime ministers and the shows that we did. Amazing. And can you quickly do your Bob Geldof? All right. Okay. Well, actually, that's because when we were talking earlier for the listener, we talked 
because Chiara, you you know Bono, don't you? Yes. Or you know My somebody, you know the Edge. You're related to the Edge. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and you said, can I do Bono? And I said, well, no, but maybe I could do Bob Geldof. And I know <laughs> that it's not the same, but it's kind of, it's like if you wanted to have an Irish rocker on the show. And I did have a story, but it's full of swear words because he rang me up one morning. And he said, Bremner, Bremner, that Becker Farage, he's fucking taken over, fucking boats on the Thames, he's doing a fucking flotilla. And he said, I'm going to get a guy going to take over every feckin' bridge. I've got fire hoses, I've got low loaders, I've got loudspeakers. We're going to feck him up. I said, Bob, I'm on the school run. You're on speakerphone. Oh, right. I said, I've got my daughter with me. What's her name? Ava. Okay, Ava, Ava. It doesn't feck matter, okay? Anyway, apologies <laughs> for the sort of swearing, you know, you got the picture. But yeah, that's my daughter's um, political education, and uh, for some reason she doesn't like Mondays. Amazing. Amazing. Did you get? Did you not get Bob on your podcast? No, he said no. Did he say, I don't like podcasts? And you have to say, tell me why. I don't like podcasts. <laughs> tell me why. I don't like podcasts. I'm going to shoot. Ooh, 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 ooh. Sorry. Amazing. That's Gelder for you. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So now I'm going to lay down a challenge for you to go away and learn some Bono. And hopefully I'll hear it one day. <laughs> oh, my God. Do you want me to do it? Uh, are you going to pay me or should I do it pro bono? See oh, I tell you what, there. if you do it on a TV show, I'll take the credit and then I'll know who's behind it. How about that? There you go. There you go. Chiara, it'll be your moment of great glory. Amazing. So I did, yeah. I did some other Irishman. I used to say, uh, uh, Louis Walsh was there. Okay, Chiara, you got a great podcast. We're going to do it together. It's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. Like I want people to vote. I want people to like your podcast. I want people to vote for you. You look like a pop star. You sound like a pop star. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, <laughs> I love the X Factor. That was who is it? Peter Dixon used to, do. ladies and gentlemen. What that great voice he used to do, Rachel Adadeje. Very good, very good. Thank you. Brilliant. La East. Brilliant. Will Young. Well done. Brilliant. Thank <laughs> you. That's very funny. Um, brilliant. And so. Coming round quickly to what we're going to talk about afterwards. So I met you at the amazing conference in Scotland. So let's tell our listeners all about that conference, about ADHD. Yeah. <laughs> it's a conference called ITICOM. So ITICOM, short for It Takes All Kinds of Minds, yeah. uh, organised by Sophie Dow and her friends and people with the Salverson uh, Mind uh, Charity, Mind Room. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I got involved because there's a relative of mine who's diagnosed with ADHD some years ago. And I recognized so many of the things that rang bells and uh, with my childhood, because I said I was very sort of irrepressible, a bit of a show off at school. And uh, a lot of that sort of tied in with you know being um, a bit impetuous, taking on too much, having too much energy, um, sometimes being a little bit disruptive, not always, you know, uh, respecting people's uh, boundaries in terms of, you know, and so, do, jump in while they were talking or this or that and that kind of ties in with the the adhd and so i thought well maybe there's something here and a lot of people discover about uh, dyslexia or dyspraxia or these different neurodiverse things because they see it in a relative and then they get themselves diagnosed so um, that's what happened in, in my case and um, i did a documentary about it which is somewhere on the bbc called adhd and me where i did uh, i got diagnosed and um but it was through all that process I got to meet Tony Lloyd at the ADHD Foundation. Now, the ADHD Foundation based in Liverpool, they're absolutely brilliant. And they've kind of helped me every step of the way. Um, because to explain broadly, ADHD, okay, what is it? So it's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Straight away, I don't like those D's in there. It's not deficit. It's not attention deficit. It's not that you're not paying attention. It's that you're paying attention to too many things. And your brain is, you know, you're distracted all over or distracted. Maybe it's attention distracted hyperactivity disorder. I'll come back to this disorder in a moment. But yes, you are easily distracted. Um, uh, it's a bit like being in an open plan office where, you know, you're on the computer and you keep getting um, your, a, a ding of notification from your WhatsApp or from, uh, you know, emails or text messages. The person next to you is talking on the phone, talking loudly. There's television on the wall. There's a fire engine going past. All these things distract your attention. So it's not 
attention deficit. It's just there are too many things to pay attention to. And my goodness, you know, what these do now, I mean, this, the mobile mm. phone is crack cocaine for people you know, who are of any propensity. You don't even have to have ADHD to mm. have your day wrecked by this thing that demands mm. attention. That mm. first word, attention. It is, so you're constantly. So maybe actually one of the reasons that uh, the, the ADHD sort of um, diagnoses it's become much more of an issue apart from the fact that we're paying attention to it mm. is that we have now a device a mobile phone but also the way that um entertainment is monetized you know the netflix and all the rest of it we've got so many different demands on our attention mm. and this and all the sites that go with it whether it's mm. facebook or whether it's uh tiktok or whether it's um instagram they're monetized on getting our attention, distracting us, mm. getting us on there all the time. So mm. there's that's the deep, that's it. It's attention is it's, it's your attention is being constantly taken away mm. and shifted to something else. That's the first. And then a disorder. And I'm trying to sort of push now recent more recently, I think there's been much more of a push that it's not a disorder. It's just minds are different. It's a different mindset. And um some of these minds are the most brilliant. Um out there, if we think about neurodiversity, which includes diver includes dyslexia and dyspraxia and ADHD and Asperger's and Tourette's as well, um, people who have these things, um, they are amongst the brightest and amongst the sharpest. Whenever I do countdown, I see people who I think I can detect on my ADHD dar that they have ADHD or Asperger's or uh, they may be autistic. And they're brilliant. They are the most wonderful that, you know, when it gets onto the figures or the words, I think I could never get near that. And I think, God, I'd employ you in a nanosecond because the thing that that makes them different, their, their ADHD or their autism, also is the thing that actually in, in other ways gives them strength. People talk about hyper, um, uh, about superpowers, don't they? Um, and I'm not dismissing the fact that it can be really debilitating having ADHD. It can really, you know, you can really beat yourself up. Um, because you've again you've stuffed up again you've forgotten your books you've blurted out in class you've um disrupted lessons you've uh, all those things but you're it it makes you who you are and that the other part of the person you are is somebody who is always creative always restless always has energy now if you're a footballer or a sportsman like michael phelps 22 times olympic medal winner or if you're um simone vile uh so in biles sorry so in biles the um the gymnast she where the russians hacked the medical records guess what she is on uh ritalin she's on on methylphenidate um so sportsmen many sportsmen many creatives many actors a lot of comedians have adhd because while it makes them not the most organized person in the world uh, and not the most um, sort of disciplined person in the world, nevertheless makes them gives the most extraordinary creative energy and positive energy. So I think we are. It's our time now. I think it really is our time. And those people who are neurodiverse, I mean, like like one in ten in the population is supposed to be dyslexic, and yet forty percent of millionaires are dyslexic. Mm -hmm. Dyslexics are brilliant at solving clues. I did a talk the other day, the day at MI six of all places. And we were talking about neurodiversity. And I'm sure a lot of the people I was talking to who would have been experts in counterterrorism or espionage yeah. or all these, it was fascinating. I, mean, I would have loved to have heard their stories. But the reason that they were in there was because they thought differently. And mm -hmm. in government, they were trying to get in. Dominic Cummings was trying to get people into government who thought differently. So I think we're moving for a situation where thinking differently isn't seen as a... Um, uh, a, a curse or a, or a, a problem but being seen as as an advantage it's not a liability it's a it's an advantage it's a positive in many areas um and as i say it's our it's our time i think people are coming to understand it and um i think mental health generally um people are, are concentrating and understanding and making making more um more of an effort um, it's to the extent that, you know, you get the pushback from the mail and the telegraph and people sort of say, oh, you know, why are all these people getting diagnosed? What are all these people? Well, they're only getting diagnosed because if you're one in 20 of the population, you know, you can expect more people to be coming forward because mm -hmm. it's still sort of underrepresented, underrepresented. And in terms of medication, yes, more people need to be on meds because, I mean, there are 600,000 people of school age. Statistically, if it's one in 20, 600,000 school kids out there with ADHD, and we're, there's still only 
only, 250,000 people on ADHD meds, 250,000 adults, I think. And when you think there's 8 million people on antidepressants, you know, what's the crisis? Is it in depression or is it in ADHD, which we're learning to understand and learning to manage, not just using medication, but using, you know, therapy as well. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the, you know, people who are easily distracted, um, impetuous, not the most organized, can often be the same people that have these brilliant brains that make connections that can be enormously positive, that mm. work great working in teams. And Francis Ford Coppola, the I think was the, the godfather, didn't he? And he said the things that you're um, excluded from work or sacked for, for when you're young are the things that they give you lifetime achievement awards for later uh, later in life. So, you know, we've got to sort of see the see the problems as positives and i've i try to think in life of, of, of crisis to have a crisis is often often an opportunity mm. and somehow or other while not making light of the mm. really you know the, the real difficulties that people can have when they're they feel impaired by adhd because it means that they're, they're, it's, it's hard for them to hold down a relationship or hard for them to hold out a job mm. you know that's i'm not making light at all but mm. somehow if you could you can find a way through that. Sometimes it may be in a diagnosis. Sometimes it might be in terms of understanding um, or sorry, of, of talking with somebody who understands the condition. So you can have um, you know, a certain amount of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, you know, there is, there are, you're not alone. You're not alone. Yeah. Um, and while I see it as my best friend and my worst enemy, it yes, it's my worst enemy, but there's also things that I can do with it. Yeah. And I often say to people, you know, they said, oh, my husband's got bad ADHD and, you know, he drinks too much and this and that. And I say, well, what's he good at? And they say, he's brilliant at his job. I say, well, go back and tell him that one of the reasons you love him is he's brilliant at his job. He could never do his job as wonderfully as he can exactly. if he didn't have ADHD. So the same thing that makes him brilliant at his job makes it a little bit harder for him to cope at home maybe. And maybe he's trying to, you know, the drinking yeah. is a kind of self-medication. And maybe to encourage him that instead of taking, you know, the wrong kind of medicine, as it were, you know, there are things that could help him to manage because it's not a, there's not a cure for ADHD, but you can help to manage it. And you can help to manage it, and society as a whole um, can help to not manage it, but to understand it and understand that these minds are different, um, and get off their back as well. Because you know you got these people say, "Oh, you know, all these people are dying. This. Why are all these people going around? Why are all these people taking meds? Why are all these people taking Ritalin?" Mm -hmm. And you don't say, you don't get people saying, "Oh, look at all these people. Why are all these people wearing glasses? Look at all these people wearing glasses." Mm -hmm. Well. You know, the reason they're wearing glasses is they found a way to see more clearly. Mm. And I think let's think about, um, you know, Ritalin or let's think about, you know, ADHD meds in that light that for many people, they make the difference between them being able to focus and concentrate and contribute and make the most of their, their brains um, because they manage all the, the clutter and the, that gets in the way when, when you've got a brain that... Uh, runs off in different directions mm. for two reasons actually you, you're often distracted because you're not producing dopamine which is the, the chemical that we have in our brains that rewards and stimulates and stimulates us and people with adhd they, they don't process that very well mm. um, and so sometimes we overcompensate instead of getting our brains up to speed normally and and yeah. for those that lovely chemical to be running through our brains we have to find a way to work ourselves up if you like and similarly, you know, our brains are like maps of the world where some of the pieces are missing. There's a great big jigsaw puzzle and everyone else can put the pieces together. But for some reason, those of us with ADHD, we can't necessarily do that because guess what? Some of the pieces are missing and some of those we'll find, but not all of them we'll find. But my goodness, you know, we have we are we have intense powers of concentration, tremendous energy. And, um, and I think it's our time and, you know, People end up in, in, in prison or young offenders institute up to 25% of the prison population are people who, you know, if this had been spotted early on and their pathway had been moved out of one where they were sent out of class, got in with a bad crowd, uh, found the only way that they could occupy their relentlessly um, hyperactive brain was through some activity which is sort of not, uh, which, which got them into trouble instead of that you get it in a creative way it would be brilliant absolutely brilliant. it could transform society there exactly. you go there's adhd and i think for me 
my obviously my disability is a learning disability but for me growing up my brain didn't work very well so I really struggled in the three schools that I went to I just couldn't learn I couldn't understand I couldn't communicate what I was feeling and in the end when I was 10 years old my third school just went hold on a minute that something's not right here why hasn't anybody picked this up before and nobody had bothered to ever kind of think about it. And so then they brought in this lady into my school and she was like, I think she has a learning disability, but I can't I can't officially diagnose her until we've tested her. And nobody tested me before I started school. I saw no one. And so had I seen someone and been like assessed when I was younger, it would have been picked up much quicker, but I wasn't. And so at the age of 10, I finally got diagnosed as having a learning disability. And then I went from mainstream school. I left mainstream school forever at that point. And then I went to a special needs school. I went there for five years. I left with five GCSEs. And now I have a 24 year career. I'm married. I have my own home and I have an amazing podcast. Well, there you go. And see, there you go. So it, 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 it can happen. And yeah. you know that. I, but do you think schools are better now? Do you think it would be, it would be picked up now earlier than it was in your case? I'm hoping so. I'm hoping now that things are starting to get better. I hope I would. Um, I sometimes actually think I wish I could go back to that four-year-old or that five-year-old and go back and go, actually, if things were different now, what would my life be now? And I sometimes think about that. And I think, actually, if they had the right teaching support, if they had the right time for me, the right resources for me, I could try and stay in mainstream school, but unfortunately, when I was 10, I was told by these professionals I would never survive in mainstream school ever again, even if I was to go to another one. So I then had to go to a special educational school. So that was the decision that was made for me because I but was... you got back into mainstream capacity. school? I had to, yeah. As you said, you got back into mainstream school. I think a lot more, they, 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 what I've seen in some schools are that they're bringing the special education needs part of it back into the back yeah. into the body of the school and not just you know, somewhere at the far end of the drive somewhere. Yeah. Um, so I think they're, you know, they're, they're making positive steps. And they also, but they're not always, they're not always getting it right. I went to a special needs classroom the other day and okay. all the walls were, were just paste, you know, covered with things about mm -hmm. dyslexia and dyspraxia and ADHD wow. and 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 I thought, well, it was, it was well intentioned, but I said, you know, but if you go into a classroom like that, what are you going to do, Chiara? Yeah, exactly. you're going to read the walls, bounce off the walls. You're going to, you know, you're yeah. going to be somebody's going to be trying to talk to you. And I mean, I was standing there, going, oh, read about dyslexia, and you know, because yeah. the whole point is those things on the walls. I suppose this is going to tell you about what dyslexia is. This is going to tell, you. and so you want to read those. Classic example yeah. of you know something well intentioned, but actually it was distracting. And then really, in a sense, you want yeah. to have something which is as bland as possible, so you can concentrate and focus on the person who's talking to you. Yeah. So we don't always get it right, but I think that there are changes. I think that's why I keep saying it's our time because I think yeah. people are beginning to understand. If we keep banging on about it as well, um, you can make turn the people who are um, seen as somehow being disrupted into positive things well exactly. here we go listen this is the exactly. society funnily enough just as i mentioned that phones and things yeah. like that and we're in an adhd world where mm. we are constantly distracted similarly actually we are in a world where disruptive technology is a the, 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 this is a world of great disruption the great mm. disruptors people have I mean, trump and boris yeah. and people like that politically they're not my cup of tea and i they're the people that i do most often if i were to do some voices for you I, 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 Boris, if I would do that. And Trump, of course, as well, you know, very distracted, very just probably I don't think anyone's been ever, ever been so distracted. I'm totally distracted all the time. I really am. And, uh, you know, people, people say, how so I say, you know, because I'm the greatest man that ever lived. Um, so, but disruptive, disruptive, you know, things like Uber that disrupted the taxi model. So mm -hmm. instead of, you know the 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 model we'd had for years and years and years a long king something different again netflix that yeah. you know previously do you remember the time when you used to get out blockbuster videos and stuff like yeah. that now netflix is all streamed so we are in a world just as it distracts us also we're in a world where sometimes the most extraordinary creative 
mm. businesses came about from somebody thinking, well, why don't we do this differently? Mm. And it's the brains, of, you know, so one in 20 of us are um, have ADHD. One in 10 dyslexic, I mentioned earlier, yeah. one in 10 is dyslexic and 40% of dyslexics are millionaires because mm. dyslexic people think of things differently they crack codes yeah. more, more easily which is why i did a show at mi6 the other day and found myself i thought god well, these people what do they do do they do they sort of break codes do they are they counter counter terrorist experts but they were there because they had exactly the kind of brains that you needed so i'm trying to think that you know mm. it's it can be you've got to find here's my tip you know if you have adhd don't beat yourself up about it yeah. because it makes you who you are and try and find a job or a vocation in which your ADHD is an asset rather than a liability. And, yeah. you know, that's yes, you see, you see so many comedians because comedy is one perfect example of where it's the perfect career. If your brain bounces all over the place and it's in all sorts of different directions, comedy is a great thing to do because, you know, mm. you will make connections that people don't and you will come out with a joke faster because you don't have a filter. Yeah, definitely. And I think for me, when I've interviewed other comedians for my podcast, so I've interviewed Tim Vine, I've interviewed Rob Brydon, and Rob was actually saying to me that he didn't even know about learning disability until he met me. And like, that was amazing. And he went away knowing about learning disability and what it is that he didn't even know. So that was amazing. Um, wow. Like Tim Vine, I knew Tim because I grew up with him and Jeremy. We lived in the same area growing up in Surrey. So we all yes. knew each other. So that was a really lovely thing to talk about. Um, and it was really personal. And like talking to Jeremy and talking to Tim on my podcast about learning disability, it was brilliant because they knew me and like we were able to talk about it. And that was yep. amazing. And I think for me... Having this podcast has enabled me to talk about my learning disability in a really positive way and educate celebrities about what it's like to have a learning disability. Yep. So that's the whole main message on my podcast is to talk about learning disability, to dispel those taboos. Yara, can I can I ask you to identify what's what what is your specific uh, education disability? Have you have you narrowed it down? So. My learning disability is about not being able to understand complex information, kind of I have to have things broken down, I have to have information put into my brain in a very small way or else I get very frustrated um it takes me a long time to learn like I don't learn quickly I learn very slowly like I have to have things over time like you mm -hmm. can't someone yep. can't just come to me and go Kira here's a supermarket list and I need you to get all of these things I can't do that I my brain goes no stop 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 it's when people say to me Kira okay we need you to learn this. Let's sit down together. Let's work up a plan. Let's then do step one of that plan and then we'll carry on. So my brain well. needs to be able, my brain, my brain only does small, like small information, small emotions, small is that called it is, it is it processing is that a thing is, processing. Is it, is, it's is it... processing yeah 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 it's processing okay. and it's and it's really hard because i wasn't born with mine it wasn't until until later that i knew about it and so for me i've had to grow up going when you talk to me don't expect me to learn right away. Don't expect yep. me to know what you've told me in five minutes. I, I will need to take this in and I will need but to you, break it down. Yeah. But was it like that? Was it always like that for you? You said it you said yeah. it only only it was only later that you came to understand it, but yeah. you'd always struggled with that. Okay. Yeah. I always struggled until the age of ten. Once I'd gone to my special school. I was then like, I, I had people there who understood me. They got you. I had you. people they, there who got my yeah. back. Yeah, they got you. Because I see I've, I've, the, the relative of mine and and it's now, um, yeah. they say to them, um, but you've got all this information inside you. Because, yeah. I mean, you, you did, you, yeah. once they once they got you, I mean, you got good results, didn't you? I yeah. mean, you got, how many GCSEs do you get? Five. Um, C, well, just... 
a C, a three E's. Don't worry, you got five GCSEs. Yeah. We're not going to do it, but <laughs> that was brilliant. Yeah. You see, and that was because yes, in the other case I was talking about, yeah, because it's people said, look, you've got the information in, in you, but it's it's getting it out or it's processing, it's organizing it. And if there was somebody there, which there was clearly, you had somebody alongside you to help get this information, which is in your head. And yeah. the problem is, actually, I'll tell you what it is. It's like. I suppose it's like a, a a lock on a door, really. Yeah. And they had to unlock your head. Yes. Unlock your brain so the yes. information could come in. Yes. And then they had to unlock it again so the yes. information could come out. Yes. But it's all it, it, it went into your head and it got there and it was in your head and it could come out again. But it needed somebody, and it needed the it needed somebody to help you get it in and get it out in the, as well. And once yeah. that's done, I mean, look at you on your eighty second podcast. Yeah. Heavens. And, you know, uh, growing up as a kid with a learning disability, you didn't know about learning disability in the 90s. There was the Disability Discrimination Act. There was the DDA in force, but there was nothing. There was no one like me on TV. There was no one like me on the radio. There was no one like me in film. And now we're starting to see more people in the media who yeah. have a learning disability, like Tommy Jessup, Sarah Gordy, like they're just two amazing actors who have Down syndrome. And that's the most inherited form of learning disability. So if someone has Down syndrome, they might also have a learning disability. So was yours I'm inherited? Fine. Sorry? Was yours inherited, your your learning, do you think? I don't know. Mine, mine, we've never known what's cause mine um i've never been able to pinpoint like a, a cause or like i don't know because adhd um, is i think is 80 percent. adhd is 80 percent inherited and 20 percent can be yeah. from sort of trauma at a young age or a birth trauma or something like that yeah so there are 1.5 million people living in the uk with a learning disability right now but more babies wow. are being born which will mean more babies will be born with a learning disability so for me, I've been very lucky because I have an amazing family who have supported me. But if I didn't have them, I would be in a very different place right now. I would have a very different life right now. So I've been very lucky. Well, the best advice I heard from somebody, they said uh, they had a daughter who had ADHD. They went through university and they had a child. And uh, and I said, so how did you how did you cope with your daughter? And he said, we just loved her. We yeah. just loved her. And somehow or other, as a parent... Uh, or a relative, you've got to find that unconditional yeah. love yeah. and support because no child at school, as I mentioned about being disruptive, they think, think, oh, it's about naughty children and bad parents. Well, there are bad parents and there are naughty children. What we're talking about is at a different level. And no child wants to go through I mean, there's so much anxiety already in the classroom about, about nearly, or well, more than a third, 40% of our school children now yeah. have anxiety disorder they meet that criteria yeah. so there's a lot of, particularly you know they've gone through the uh, um pandemic and all that sort of stuff yeah. so there's a lot of uh, they don't want to be like that they don't want to be difficult they don't want to be disruptive they're processing um dopamine in a different way their brains mm -hmm. are different they're not responding to the same stimulus that other people are they're distracted by other children or or this um mm. and you know if we find the key to those children um you know it'd be transformative for society but you know i'm so proud of what you've done and you know it leads the way for others and it does it does take all kinds of minds and i think minds like ours i mean when they you know simon biles uh the, the yeah. gymnast and michael phelps i mentioned earlier um you know all these people um they could they, you know, the ADHD that caused them to beat themselves up perhaps because they were disorganized or mm. they, they they forgot their schoolwork again or they didn't they didn't always behave in class made them world champions because nobody could I often say to people, you know, they I meet people at seminars and they say, Oh, my husband, you know, and he struggles. And I say, Well, what's he like at his job? And they say, He's absolutely brilliant at it. And so mm. well, I say, Well, tell him that. Tell him how good he is at his job and say, you know, he could only be that good because he's different. And yes. let's celebrate that. I think we need to go to a stage where we're yeah. celebrating difference. I mean, you can't use your disability or your um, ADHD or whatever. I don't think you can use it as an excuse all the time. You no. can't say, look, I I have got a learning zone. I don't deal use with it. it as an excuse. You know no. what I mean? Um, it's not for me. It's, oh, by the way, I, I should pick myself up there. It's not for me to say, but I'm just uh, really. But I think the point is that yeah. if you've got a learning disability and you're trying to overcome it, you know that's a daily thing and and you know 
you should be so proud of yourself for doing that but you know there are people out there who they don't understand they've not met you before and if you come at them aggressively and saying you know you've got to understand me um it's different i I think it's just to say i suppose you just have to you know say i'm i'm really sorry could could, you might have to repeat that because i'm you know um I'm, I'm just I think a li- I think a little bit differently and so you're going to have to process you're going to have to yeah. post this my my, the, my my brain has got a slightly different shape letterbox you're going to have to post it differently yeah so for me my favorite color is pink so when people are working with me at, in my job they either wear something pink or they use a pink item and they get to know me as Kira and now whenever I work with anyone at Mencap they're like oh did you see I had that pink top on today day we're going to have a meeting later so like they use it to get to know me and, and I can see, see you got can you got pink I can see there's pink on your shirt now and yes, there's also there's a lot of orange I love orange it's my favorite color orange because that's the color my face is I've got a very orange face but for you it's going to be a pink face I think but anyway um but listen it's been an absolute delight talking to you and I hope you know so that's how I got where I got to um and that's I hope like you I just want to spread hope for people who think differently because you know it's 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 um what can what to other to some people is a a, a, a liability is in many cases an asset what it's what you think of as your worst power. enemy is your superpower yeah and embrace it uh and i think you've got to learn to laugh at the bad things yeah. and celebrate the good ones because yeah. you will you know you'll you'll yeah i'm sure you'll you're aware of, you'll trip up and i think if you go oh do you know what i trip up again but but it's I, that's the person i am and yeah. I think partly actually with diagnosis as well, like with you, with the disability, once you pick that up or once you know about the, once you have the diagnosis, you're in charge. And you, whatever this thing is that plays with your brain, whether it's a disability or a disorder, you, whatever you call it, you've got it now. Mm. You you know that you're in charge and it's yeah. not going to tell you what to do anymore. You're going to tell it what to do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So if you have the ADHD, say, right, OK, I've got this. But you know what? Guess what? Knowing that I have ADHD means I know how I can manage it and I know to laugh at it. I know this is never going to wreck my life again. I'm going to take it and yeah. um, I'm going to laugh at it. I'm going to, but I'm going to make it work in my favor. Yeah. And um, it's a very simplistic way of putting it. But, yeah. but you know, take what, take who you are and go out and conquer the world. Brilliant. And go thank go. you so much again. Pleasure. And I right. promise not to bother you again. <laughs> No, you don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. You can email anytime, but uh, get in touch. That's lovely. Okay, all right. And thank you to the listeners. And well done, Kira. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.